like a little bit about yourself and who you are and what you do? So I'm a professor at, of childhood education and literacy development um, at NYU uh, in New York. And um, before that, I've been here about 10 years um, and I've taught both undergraduate and graduate education. And before that, I was a professor at University of Michigan um, for 14 years. And then before, during that, I was assistant secretary for elementary and secondary education um, under George W. Bush in charge of No Child Left Behind. And then um, before that, I was a professor at Temple University. So that's just a little bit about me in terms of, of um, what I do. And then what brought you to NYU? I, what brought me to NYU? I was very happy at the University of Michigan, which is a wonderful school of education. But I yearned to be um, in uh, urban settings and to work with students who have reading difficulties and reading needs. And um, I could imagine, with no disrespect to all of you, um, I could imagine no other city as wonderful as New York um, to begin to um, really understand urban education. Um, because New York is the largest school district in the entire country. And so I felt like if we could begin to do something there, we could begin to do something anywhere. Um, so what attracted me was the diversity. I like being around um, people of diverse cultures and ethnicities. Um, and I felt it really provided that opportunity for me. Okay, next we have a, a funny question. <laughs> if you were an ice cream flavor, what would you be and why? <laughs> if I was an ice cream flavor? Yes. <laughs> oh, passion fruit. Oh, that's <laughs> that. <laughs> so I'm very passionate about education. So oh, <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, what inspired you to promote literacy? Um, what inspired me was, uh, I think it's an impediment uh, for so many kids. So um, very early in my career, I went into a, a classroom and I saw these beautiful children who were so um, incredibly smart. You could just see it. Um, you could see it in their eyes and the way they were responding to things, but they had no words to be able to describe how they were feeling and what they were experiencing. And I realized that it wasn't, it was uh, the lack of language for these kids that really curtailed so many of the opportunities for them. And um, so I thought this is the road to knowledge. If you can't read, think about how difficult your life must be. I mean, you can't get a, um, a driver's license. You don't know how to take medicine. You don't, you rely on other people instead of being able to read something on your own. You become very dependent in society if you can't read and read really well. And um, so that's really what began to drive me in terms of literacy and, um, and recognizing that so many children could have so many more opportunities if they only could read better. Uh, what experience promoting literacy has most affected you and why? Oh, that's an interesting question. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what happened to me. I was at Temple University. It was one of my um, first jobs in an urban setting. And I asked parents to walk with me to the nearest school. Um, and 
if you know Philadelphia, which is a smaller city than New York, um, everybody walks everywhere. So we would walk to the school. And as we walked, the children would have to step on tremendous amounts of garbage. We passed places where there were names on, you know, graffiti and names on buildings, but the names on the, on the building were people who died from drug overdoses. Um, there was no playgrounds. There was no um, um, anything for these children could uh, to play with. And I remember saying to myself, what does this do to a child and their sense of hope and their sense of being able to be successful in school? What does that do to their aspirations? And <clears throat> through that, I realized that the immediate environment has tremendous effects on what you do. So even now when I am home um, in New York and I'm walking home from NYU, I'll pass restaurants and I'll realize that, gosh, I wasn't hungry until I saw this restaurant and now I realize I'm hungry. So the environment has an enormous press on everything you and I might do. And so what I began to do was say, how could we begin to change the environment for children so that they we could have <clears throat> we could have a more positive um, environment for them to learn. And so that's when we began to change the environment in classrooms. And what we did is we took books and we created areas within a classroom where the children would literally have to bump into a book in order to um, pass by. And we found that when they had to pass by those books, you know what they did? They picked them up and they started reading. And so we began to understand that, hey, if we change that environment, then the likelihood that they would do something that they were just not necessarily thinking about before they would do. So that's when we became very, very interested in the environment and changing the environment so that children could really have greater opportunity to have books, um, greater opportunity to read. Let's see, uh, what was it like serving as the U.S. Assistant Secretary of Elementary and Secondary Education in the U.S. Department of Education? Well, that's a great question. Um, it was very hard. So what I realized is that you can be a teacher. I've been a teacher and you can be an academic. You know, I've been a professor for many, many years. But when you go into the federal government, and in my role as assistant secretary, you now have a boss. Um, in my world, I don't have a boss. Um, I can do what I think is the right thing. Just like a teacher. A teacher doesn't really have a boss. Maybe they have a principal, but I don't think of them as a boss. But when you go into the federal government, you have a boss. And my boss was George W. Bush. He was the president. And as a result, what you have to do is you have to align everything you say with what he believes. And that can be very hard for someone who's had a good deal of free speech. So for example, if I feel that children do not have resources and that we should be buying more books for children, I can't necessarily say that if my boss doesn't believe in it, <laughs> I can't. So I have to keep my mouth shut. I have to not say the things I often believe in. So in federal government, you have to be loyal. Um, and the key thing of being loyal sometimes can be very hard for an academic when you have your own beliefs and strategies. So that's the negative. The positive is that I felt that I could really do a lot. So for example, we started a program called Early Reading First, where we put 
$4 million in every early childhood setting for high poverty kids for a small period of time. And we could put books and we could train teachers and we could do a good deal to really improve children's achievement. Now the negative, the minute the administration changes, they get rid of the money. So you're often in the situation where you're um, making changes and then the next administration can easily um, get rid of those changes. And so those are some of the challenges you have in going to the federal government. Adding on to that, in your role and as your roles have progressed, what have you found to be the most effective way to promote literacy? The, the most successful way to promote the literacy? The most effective and most successful way to promote literacy. Um, I just wrote an article uh, last year that focused on um, small wins, you know, W-I-N-S. And what I think is, and Rylan, this is why I love what you do. Um, I think that it's the most effective strategy or small strategies to affect local um, government, local communities and neighborhoods. And so more and more of my work has really focused on the neighborhood, understanding and working within neighborhoods to make fundamental change for people in that neighborhood. So I think that while these federal laws can be um, very all encompassing, they don't necessarily make the fundamental change that occurs within neighborhood. And I have come to think that the work that we're doing, whether it's in laundromats or playgrounds, <laughs> or we're in barber shops this year. Um, where else are we? Um, nail salons. That when we, and what we're doing is something very simple. We're putting books and we're training barbers and we're training grocery workers on how to interact with children over literacy development. That those may, small efforts might be the biggest bang for the buck in the long run. And um, I'm very hopeful that some of the kinds of work that you're doing, getting kids to get really involved in their local community is the way to go. Thank you very much. And tying into that question as well, what advice would you give to young people who want to make an impact in literacy and education moving forward and even as most of us go off to college as well? Right. I, I think that you're on the right track. And what I mean by that is, you know, I'm part of a, a number of networks that focus on mother and child interaction and helping parents become um, more literacy partners. I think um, that's very helpful. But at the same time, I think that what happens is um, change is made on a community basis and on a neighborhood basis. And so therefore, what I would say to all of you is to get involved in your neighborhood, get involved in the places in which you work. So one of the things I do, for example, even with my undergraduates at NYU, is they're going to go and be a teacher in a school. But what I have them do is I have them walk the neighborhood um, where their children are likely to go. And I want them to become familiar with local shopkeeper and the local parents and where people get their food and where people go banking and day-to-day -day activity, because I think that's where they're going to be able to make change. Um, I think it's not necessarily in the classroom. I think it might be out of the classroom. Um, and that sounds kind of funny for someone who teaches teachers, but that's my belief. <laughs> no, that's extremely interesting. And I really like the idea and the process of doing the undergraduates and having them walk the campus.
You have written over 100 articles addressing literacy. What is the writing process like for you? Oh, it's so hard. Um, <laughs> the writing process is always very, very hard and challenging. Um, it is both, um, it's something that Mahali once said, he talks about flow and the notion of flow. So what happens when I start writing is I have a panic attack and I look at, at um, a blank screen and I say, oh my gosh, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to begin. I'll never be able to do this. And then what I start doing is I start reading and I read some of my colleagues' work and those words begin to get in my brain and I start having some ideas and then I, I start playing with writing and it takes days and days and days before I can frame my thoughts into what I think is a coherent argument. Oh, it, it's so hard. And then when I'm just at the brink, I'm so frustrated with myself, I'll feel like I'll go for a walk or something. I have a great dog and the dog and I will go for a walk and I'll say, aha, I think I've gotten it. I come back and I'll keep trying at it. And eventually I feel, oh my goodness, it's starting to cook. And then when that moment happens, it's starting to cook, I get this sense of flow. And what Chiksamahali called it is achievement against resistance. So achievement, finally achieving something after it's been so hard is so pleasurable, I can't tell you. Um, and that's why I write. Yeah, I think a lot more goes into writing than people think. So that's really encouraging to hear. So yeah. that if, like, if any of us ever are struggling, we just know that it's part of the process. And it's we can part of the process. You're we'll right. get to the achievement part and it'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs>
regarded as a good thing to begin with, ended up having terrible negative consequences with schools being closed for being considered failures. And, um, and as a result, it was very discouraging to work on something that you kind of knew ahead of time was not going to work, but there wasn't the will to change the law at the very beginning to enable kids to be more successful. So that's a long story to tell you about No Child Left Behind, but it's actually a, a whole course I teach. <laughs> so wow. much detail. It's an important story that I think. Agreed. Yeah. A very important story that yeah. needs to be told. Yeah. That best of attention, intentions don't always end up in the results expected. That's right. That's exactly right. What inspired you to create the world or world of words in the NYU Literacy Technology and Culture Lab? Oh, that was a wonderful opportunity. Um, actually, we got a grant in 2007, um, part of uh, the Ready to Learn initiative in the US government. And um, we got a $5 million grant to say, wow. what could we do to really change children's language and word learning opportunities? And so what we did is we worked with Sesame Street originally, and then we worked with um, other PBS Between the Lions to create a world of words, um, which was designed to be both a multimedia um, intervention or vocabulary intervention. Since that time, the program has been all over Michigan, and it's been adopted in Washington, Hawaii, um, and every single year, it has shown to have tremendous effects on children's vocabulary, concepts, and, and comprehension development. So the, the work was inspired by the fact that no one was dealing with very, very young children um, and helping them learn language very early on. And this was really sort of a unique opportunity that was both fun and, um, and effective. Interesting. Adding on to World of Words, did NYU Literacy Technology and Culture Lab kind of follow the same progression as well and building that as well? Was that under the $5 million grant too? Um, that was uh, an additional uh, set, uh, series of millions. And that was designed, um, and it was very interesting. When we moved from Michigan to New York, they wanted to scale up. It was a scaled up intervention. So now the kids have it in, you know, more than a thousand kids have it um, in, in New York City in particular. Um, and so we adapted it to, um, to ensure that more teachers could have it. So it's been an adaptation of that original program and not the same exact program. Okay, we have a few fun questions to kind of end off our time. Sure. Uh, I know that you have a pet dog. Uh, what's the dog's name and what kind of dog is it? Oh, he's a Weimariner. Um, Max, Max is, um, he, he's known as Mr. Max, and he's a, a beautiful Weimariner, which you might know from uh, William Wegman and all of his wonderful illustrations, I mean, uh, uh, photographs of, of Weimariners. He's also the Sesame Street dog, um, if you've ever seen how they make um uh, numbers on Sesame Street. Sometimes they use Weimariners. So I could bring him out in a moment. <laughs> He's very sweet. Yeah, that would be great. Do you have a favorite place in New York City? And if so, where is it? Well, I have to say my favorite place in New York City is West Village. Um, it's the Grand Village of um, New York. And it's wonderful because it's um, more diverse than any other place in the world. Um, it has a sense of great neighborhood, um, of intimacy, of beautiful old, old townhouses. 
And um, every morning I take Mr. Max to Washington Square Park where he runs and plays with other dogs. And I guess that's the moment I love the most. Oh, here he is. Um, Max, let me just see if I can. There. Max. <laughs> Shy. Max doesn't want to be on camera. He's a little camera shy. He's a little camera shy. Let's see. Oh, oh. oh he's beautiful. He's so pretty. <laughs> yeah. Yes, he's really. Well, it was wonderful talking to all of you guys. Yeah, you too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.